Well, ladies and gentlemen, the sun was shining brightly on my old Kentucky home about two hours ago. I don't know what happened, but the sun is shining brightly in this room here in this beautiful new building on both the University of Kentucky and the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And this is a partnership, and we're about to learn a whole lot more about this wonderful research facility. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce to you the 12th president of the University of Kentucky, Dr. Eli Capaluto. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Good morning. So mine is an immigrant family, came to this country at the turn of the last century. 150 families would come from that small area in the Mediterranean, and they settled in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, they established their faith community, and one of the first things you do is find a place to bury the dead. And so what's grateful for, what I'm grateful for is I can return to that cemetery. It's where my parents are buried. You can have moments of prayerful solitude, but as you walk through those tombstones, it's a history lesson, and it's a health history lesson too. My father's mother would die when he was just 12 or so from uh, complications associated with childbirth. Her infant that she had just birthed would die six weeks later. His father died just a few years after that. Some heart disease, it was hard to diagnose at the time, and if you look at in the 20s, the state-of-the-art treatment was bloodletting, and my father remembers that. Sounds like, you know, ancient times. And if you look back at those tombstones, you can see so many of them where infants were buried. These tombstones are just small. And then I can look at the members of this community that I knew and can recall that when they got a diagnosis of cancer, um, there wasn't much hope, and if you look at their date of birth and their date of death, and I say, gee, I didn't realize she was so young when she passed away. And if you look at data over that period of time, it tells a similar story. At the turn of the century, 1900, life expectancy in the United States for men and women, 45 to 50, years of age is what you could expect. And for African Americans, it was 15 years less than that. By the year 2000, we'd gotten to the point where life expectancy in this country had gone up by 60%. 75 to 80 years you could live. And the gap between whites and African Americans shrunk to just five years. So this was a golden age of breakthroughs, both public health and what science could yield in the form of new treatments. What's important about this building today, it's a testimony to the future. President Nixon declared the war on cancer in 1971. And year after year, when numbers didn't budge, people thought this is insurmountable. But in the 1990s, the death rates from cancer started to decline, and they've declined every year since then. Not so much in Kentucky, though. So it takes time, and buildings like this, where breakthroughs occur, are built on a graveyard of sort of good ideas that don't necessarily pan out, but they do in the long term, and for people who believe in what can happen here. We say thank you. My predecessor, Dr. Todd, told me the first time he looked at this list of causes of death in Kentucky and how we compare to the rest of the country, it was ugly. And he labeled them the Kentucky Uglies. And they still persist, unfortunately, for us today. Cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes and obesity, stroke, and now a vile culprit, substance abuse. They're ugly scars and they're decimating the landscape of the Commonwealth. 
for the first time since the flu epidemic in 1916, 17, and 18, this country is expecting life expectancy to, discrete, to dis decrease for the third year in a row. These are diseases of despair, and we can no longer indulge these. But today we're joined by our partners, partners in progress. We stand in the atrium of a modern facility that will be that shining beacon of hope, a testament to the idea that we can turn the tide of all this disease and the suffering and the calamities that befall not only individuals, but their entire families. We stand in the manifestation of UK's promise. This new multidisciplinary research building, a $265 million promise of a better and brighter future for Kentucky. And as the president of the University of Kentucky, I want to take this moment to applaud the hundreds and thousands of people that make a day like this possible. Some on the stage, all of them. We take seriously our role as the University for Kentucky. We believe we have a responsibility to be the heartbeat of our economy here. It starts in this building and the research we do. The economic impact of the extramural research we go out and compete for and the jobs and indirect jobs and so forth total some $636 million. But more important, we provide those jobs and attract a talented workforce that come here to make a difference. We feel a responsibility to stir the souls of communities and transform them, to bring hope through healing. So what does all this mean today for our campus and our commonwealth in the 21st century? We believe that we can, must, and will be a leader in eradicating opioid addiction and abuse in this state. We're making a commitment to reduce cancer rates by 50%. And as researchers will attest, this work increasingly exists at the intersection of the disciplines. You'll hear from, more from Dr. Cassis this is why when we design the space, we made purposeful decisions. Uh, fewer walls, but a way to bring leading edge technology together and share. We wanted to break down the barriers between the discipline. Today, to solve any problem, you need team science. You need to bring the, bring the best and bench and basic scientists together with health behaviorists, economists, engineers, applied scientists, clinicians. So we had to create labs and spaces that facilitate this kind of partnership. And more importantly, it doesn't just happen in this building, it happens in and with communities across the Commonwealth. Discoveries really take two basic ingredients, talent and infrastructure. And because of those who join us this morning, we're on our way. And I want to take a moment to thank them. First, Congressman Andy Barr. Thank you, sir, for his continued support of UK's research enterprise. And just one example, Representative Barr led our congressional delegation's letter of support for our recent and very successful NCI designation renewal. He's here many days learning about what we do so he can be a stronger and more effective advocate. And Governor Matt Bevin, for his state, his faith in the state's flagship and land-grant research university and believing our capacity to move us forward. I'm also glad to see you here, Governor, because, see, um, Mary Lynn and I have God sons and one morning, as you can get from the governor, I got a text. It was a very important article about reforms in education and so forth. I read it quickly, and I thought it was 
one of our godchildren, Matt Levin. <laughs> so I replied, Governor, I didn't hear from, I didn't realize till the end of the day that other people were replying and you were not Matt Levin. <laughs> My reply said, good morning, Matt. <laughs> and I closed with, because Matt Levin is a physician moving into a new uh, role, I said, have you started your new role? <laughs> I'm particularly glad you showed up today, so. All right. Uh, Senate President Robert Stivers, who knows the importance of this work and his unceasing advocacy for UK and a commitment to help us reverse these dangerous trends in our state. I will not forget the legislative session of, I believe, 2014. Uh, when we learned that our request for a research building could not be met. I also remember in January of 2015 when I saw President Stivers, he asked me if I was going to attend the Kentucky Chamber dinner. And I said I was planning to. He said, good. And in the middle of that dinner, and a surprise for all of us, he said we did the Commonwealth wrong and the University of Kentucky wrong and overlooking a request for this research bill. And he led an effort, which resulted in bipartisan support, to open up the budget in a non-budget year so we could celebrate a day like today. The Commonwealth committed half of the $265 million investment several years ago, and during the last budget cycle, provided an additional $40 million of state bonds. We must do the rest. And we're committed to delivering on this investment. Others I want to acknowledge. The UK Board of Trustees for their support of our shared vision of UK's research, enterprise goals, and our capacity to help Kentucky. About five years ago, we shared with our trustees at a retreat focusing on research how we thought we could make a difference and after a period of flat NIH funding, our belief that the federal government would begin to increase resources that our talented scientists could compete for if they had the infrastructure. So thank you for believing in us and endorsing our plans. And Vice President for Research, Lisa Cassis. This building is her baby. You can tell when you, she takes you on a tour. She's an all-star researcher who alone, I think, has attracted between 30 and $40 million of research during her tenure at the University of Kentucky. She brought her mind and, more importantly, her heart to bear on this project, her personal expertise in guiding the design of this building. As a researcher who um, talks the talk but walks the walk, she could listen carefully to what people thought would make this unique in bringing these disciplines together. And finally, the real heroes, our pioneers in healthcare providers, principal investigators, postdocs, all those myriad disciplines who will come together in this space to forge new and creative solutions to the problems that have vexed Kentucky and the world for far too long. Now we have a greater likelihood to take advantage of an opportunity to harness our persistent determination and boundless compassion to provide hope to our fellow citizens. We stand today united by a clarion call that our efforts and intellect, our passion and commitment, our days of never ever being indifferent to the problems of our fellow Kentuckians, we're going to show the world what Kentucky can do. Thank you all very much. Thank you, President Capilouto. A few other people in attendance today that I want to take this moment to recognize from the mayor's office, Kevin Atkins, please raise your hand. From uh, Leader McConnell's office, Senator McConnell, Stephanie Nelson. 
Also with us, State Senator Ralph Alvarado. Thank you, sir, for being here. And we have Liz Thomas, who's the Legislative Director for Congressman Barr, and also from Congressman Barr's office, Leslie Small. Thank you all for being here. Which brings us to none other than Congressman Barr. He is the third term congressman from the 6th District of Kentucky. He's been serving in Congress for six years, so please help me to welcome Congressman Andy Barr. Thank you, Carl, and thank you, President Capilouto, for inviting me to join you all in celebration of this beautiful new building. This is the first opportunity I've had to come into this uh, unbelievable building, and it is a day of great celebration for the University of Kentucky and the entire Commonwealth and what this investment represents. Um, I said this yesterday when we were with Dean Lepart uh, for another announcement with the Sports Medicine Research Institute here at UK. Very rarely does a week go by in Washington, D.C., and Liz, my legislative director, can, can, can talk about this, where we do not meet with an investigator, a researcher, a professor from the University of Kentucky who is educating our office about the amazing breakthroughs and the research and the work that they're doing. And over the years, we've gotten a chance to get to know amazing people who are making a difference in our society, like Linda Van Eldick and her team at the Sanders Brown Center on Aging, or Mark Evers at Marquis, or Dean Lepart and what he's doing for our special operators and our, and our military service members with the research and the cross application of, of, of sports medicine and how it, how it can apply to our warriors. It's amazing to listen to Rodney Andrews talk about the Center for Applied Energy Research. And so what this represents today, this building, this celebration of this new facility, is a celebration of all the great work that's going on at UK. And it's such a privilege uh, and, a, and a responsibility for me to represent UK and the researchers and the investigators here. And I get a chance to go out and talk to people like Tom Cole who's the Cardinal. He's the subcommittee chairman for Labor HHS with jurisdiction over appropriations for the National Institutes of Health. I get to tell him about what's going on at UK. I get to talk to the top officials at the National Institutes of Health about the groundbreaking work that's going on at Sanders Brown or at Marquis. Um, and we need it. We need it because we are number one in cancer. We're, we're number two in heart attacks. We're number five in um, drug overdoses. We've, we're number six in strokes. And, and it's really great to see that UK is leading the way and pioneering uh, the potential for cures. And so it's easy for me to go to Washington and vote for the 21st Century Cures Act, to vote for appropriations to increase funding like we did this year by $3 billion for the National Institutes of Health. And so easy, President Capilouto, Dr. Cassis, Dr. Newman, to then go to bat uh, with uh, leading a delegation letter uh, for funding for these specific programs um, and asking the NIH to recognize the amazing work that's going on here at UK. The fact that we have an investment like this, uh, this facility, gives us greater leverage to go after those federal dollars. And it's an exciting opportunity for UK to look into the future and to see that we're going to be at the cutting edge, leading the way to find cures, to find breakthroughs. Uh, and this facility makes the argument even more compelling for me when I go to Washington. Uh, Dr. Capilouto, President Capilouto talked about partnerships. Uh, I'm proud to be part of that partnership. Um, congratulations and uh, know that you've got a strong partner in our office and we look forward to many years uh, ahead when this facility and the researchers and the human beings that work here will, will lead the way in some of these cures. And I, I think about, when I think about these researchers and I meet them all the time, so proud of what they do, I think about my Aunt Elsie, who spent years and years in the lab here at UK as a researcher herself. Uh, so many people in the Lexington community have friends and family members who either work here at UK or can recognize that the work of the people here at UK are making a difference uh, with their families uh, and their loved ones as well. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Congressman Barr. And I just have to go back a moment for the president with his very funny story. I just want to assure our next speaker that if I do get a text message, I'll know who it's from, Matt Bevan. <laughs> Please welcome the governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, Matt Bevan. Bevan, Levin, it's all good. 
There's a lot of people here to hear from. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Thanks for taking time out of your day. Uh, I was struck by something. You might have seen me pull my phone out as Dr. Capilouto was speaking. Uh, and you, most of you won't be able to see what I'm showing you here. But it's a photo. Some of you in the front can see it. I want you to see that. There's, there's 10 little tombstones all in a row. This was, these were all children in a single family that died in a two-year period. And I was struck by this. It's a picture I took some time ago. Uh, and as you were speaking, I was reminded of it. And I was pretty sure I had it in my phone, and I do. This is, what, this is why this matters. I mean, you just heard a very poignant story from the president of this university about his own family. You think about the reasons why people used to die of things that are now presumably curable. And yet even now in our state and around this country and around the world, people still die of things that could be cured. In a world where we operate increasingly with these as a form of communication. And in a world where people do a whole lot of this, even when they're sitting in the same room as one another, there really is no substitute at all for the kind of collaboration that will happen in this space. There is no substitute at all for the kind of face-to-face -face dialogue that does happen and will happen and needs to happen. And in a world where we have now mapped the human genome, which opens up to us any number of possibilities, and the ability to synthesize peptides and or to target specific therapies specifically to an individual's personal genome, what this opens up to researchers now relative to what had been the case just a handful of years ago is inconceivable. We literally can't even begin to imagine what the possibilities are. And the half-life of technology is shorter than it has ever been before. And so never could there be a better time, certainly in our lifetimes, in the lifetime of medical history, than right now to have a facility like this, a dedication to this, a focus of energy and resources on this than there is right now. Our ability to derive value from what will happen under this roof is greater now than it would have been had this building been opened 5, 10, 15, or 20 years ago, no matter the effort that would have gone in. The upside potential is extraordinary. It's not unlike Kentucky in many respects. This university, specifically the work that will be done here. Just earlier this week, I was in Frankfurt. We announced a collaboration for the first time ever between cancer researchers at this university and cancer researchers up the road at the University of Louisville. Five million dollars of state monies being dedicated. A fraction of what was dedicated to the building of this building, but more than the dollars. Cancer is not going to be cured with $5 million worth of research. But again, what is the secret ingredient there? The very same thing that this building will afford us, which is collaboration. Taking some of the best and brightest cancer researching minds in the Commonwealth at this institution, at the University of Louisville, and putting them together in a collaborative effort, focusing on four or five very specific issues related to pediatric cancer. We're the only state in America dedicating monies from the general fund specifically for research on pediatric cancer. You're probably aware of it, but it's less than 1% of all cancer research is dedicated to pediatric cancers. And truth be told, yes, it only affects a small portion, but so many of the cancers that affect people who are older are not self-induced, but certain uh, choices people make contribute to the cancers they develop. Not all of them, but many of them. Those that are developed in children are invariably the result of things that had nothing whatsoever to do with that child's personal choices. The things we could learn from finding cures for those cancers would have an extraordinary ripple effect on every single one of us that is no longer a child. And so putting those kind of resources, small as they may be, being as focused and as intentional as we are being, but again in a collaborative effort, this is how great things will be done. It is an honor to be here with you, and it's an incredible honor for us to be able to, as a university, pioneer on this front. I'm quite confident the things that are going to come out of here with you and your team, I mean, you think about it, there'll be about 100 researchers, I guess, that'll be here, and 500 and some odd other folks, a lot of these doctoral students and others that will be collaborating that you heard mention of just a moment ago. So you'll have hundreds of people every day in this open environment. 
inspiring not only one another, but others on this campus, young people, you know, who will walk through, see this, and maybe be inspired to be a part of the very solutions. So thank you for being here to celebrate this. Thank you to all those who have been thanked. And I also want to thank one other constituency that may have been thanked, but if they weren't, it's an important one. It's the men and women, many are alum and some are not, who give of their own resources to make this possible. The state put a lot of money into this, the taxpayers of Kentucky. The university put a lot of its resources into this. But a significant portion of what made this possible was due to the private donations and generosity of men and women who wanted to see this happen. So if you happen to be among those who also contributed to this, thank you, because it couldn't have happened without you. And at the end of the day, everything, all of this, comes at the expense of somebody somewhere, dollars that might have gone somewhere else. Good things are going to come from this. I often talk about planting seeds. That's what we've done. The germination process will happen, but I think we're going to harvest things out of here a whole lot more quickly than we would have imagined. So thank you for being a part of it. Thank you to those of you in front of me, those of you behind me that are going to make this possible. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Governor Bevan. One other person we want to recognize from Senator Rand Paul's office, Micah Sims. Micah, where are you? There she is. Nice to have you with us. Our next speaker is the Kentucky Senate President, Robert Stivers, who, as President Capilouto already alluded to, played a very key role in this. Please welcome the President of the Kentucky Senate, Robert Stivers. First of all, let me thank everyone uh, on the podium, Governor, Congressman Dwyer, uh, President Capilouto, the other members here. Uh, as you see, I apparently didn't get the memo. Uh, I wore gray slacks instead of dark slacks. Uh, but truly, uh, it's a pleasure here. And I'm, I'm going to go back and I heard somebody talk about me yesterday saying that I was kind of like a old guy with a lot of history. and. I want to go back to 2013. Dr. Capilouto mentioned a few things, and that's when I became the Senate president. And I got, got a phone call, and it was Joe Kraft. He said, Robert, I want to talk to you about uh, something doing in the 2013 session uh, related to athletics and uh, doing something with the Commonwealth Stadium. And you're probably going to get a call from uh, Mitch Barnhart. I said, okay, this, this is pretty cool. I got a call from Joe Kraft. I never have gotten a call from him. A few minutes later, I get a call, and they say, well, it's Mitch Barnhart. He wants to talk to you. So they're talking about doing something with Commonwealth Stadium and uh, the Nutter Center and expanding it, and it's no longer the Nutter Center. So they want to talk to me about numbers and figures. And they said, well, you're probably going to get a few other calls. Not long after that, somebody walks in, they yell back and said, um, you got a call from Eli Capluto. And I said, well, why wasn't it Calipari? <laughs> but, but his name is a lot easier to pronounce than Ben DePuti. Uh, I just have to tell you that. But as he told me, I got warmed up by Calipari uh, before I got to Capluto. But truly, in uh, 2013, the first bill I signed as a Senate president was House Bill 7 which I hope tomorrow there'll be about 70,000 people over in Kroger Field, what used to be Commonwealth Stadium, yelling on a renovated facility, uh, and we will see the University of Kentucky football team uh, beat Mississippi tomorrow. <laughs> but that's not what this job is about. And as much pleasure as I took in that, I took much displeasure in something that occurred in 2014. 2014, the number one priority of this university was building this research facility. We'd set parameters that if uh, we put up half, the universities would have to come up with half of the construction money. And at the end of the day, the number two priority was a law school. And it was other people's position, other than mine, that we fund the law school instead of this. I'm a lawyer, and I can tell you, one thing we don't need, Governor, any more of is lawyers. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yeah, all right, we got Ralph Alvarado clapping for that too. But we did. We didn't fund this facility, uh, and we came back. And all the other things that go on, I can't tell you about uh, mapping the human genome or anything else. What I can tell you is what I know. I asked a few people, and I know Frank Shoup, who's originally from Clay County, is on the board here. I asked a few of my friends to come up from Clay County. After that session, you go home and you think about Bob Madden. And many people don't know who Bob Madden is, but his son's a lawyer, and he was here in this facility. Clinton Johnson, who actually was a magistrate at the time, he's up in the UK for various things, all related. All these people had problems related to diabetes, cancers, heart disease, obesity, high cholesterol. A couple of my friends are here that know these names. And then you come back and you have somebody like a Merle Sizemore who has a heart problem that actually got some national recognition because it was his lab his black lab who helped him get back to the house before he could get here to UK because he had had a massive heart attack. So when you walk out of a session and you see, we didn't fund that. We failed the university. But a state that has all the poor health care indices that this state has. And when you go back to your home and you come back to Frankfurt, you don't check your life experiences at the door of the Senate chamber. You remember the Clinton Maddens, the Merle Sizemores, the Bob Maddens. That seven, you also remember that 7% of the patient visits at the Chandler Medical Center come from Knox County, Whitley County, Clay County, Alsey County, Wolf County. You think about those things. So 2015, I asked Dr. Capluto and actually Steve Byers to get me some facts on this building shortly because we just shot straight into the state chamber dinner. And I wanted to say that. I didn't talk about anything else. And Governor, you know we always get up there and it's a preview of what's going to be in the session. And the preview, everybody was going to say the same thing. And I decided to take a different track. Because truly in 2014, we failed this university. But most importantly, more importantly, we failed the people of this state. So. A day like today, and you think about what will happen tomorrow on this campus, it's, it's great. It's wonderful. But this is what's truly going to make the difference in so many people's lives. And as I actually did have a conversation with Joe Kraft one day, I'm going to walk on this campus sometime and they're not going to know who I am. They won't have a clue. The institution of government will go, long, go on long after I've left. But what I can say is that when I leave and I'm done with whatever I have to do with this institution of government, I'll know I've made a difference. That there will be some child, some parent, some person in this state, because President Capilouto, you're going to bring some of the best researchers in here for all these problems. And those 10 children that you have the, the image of, of their headstones, we can avoid that. And that's what this is about, and being in service is about knowing that you have made a future that will be brighter and that the sun truly will shine on our old Kentucky home. So I'm proud to be here. I'm proud to stand up and say, this is UK. They're doing the best, and it is going to make a difference. Thank you all. Thank you, Senate President Stivers, for those powerful words. Our next speaker has been at UK less than two years. He's off to a great start. He's got a big job. He's got big dreams to advance this place even further. We're talking about UK healthcare and the University of Kentucky. Please welcome UK's Executive Vice President for Health Affairs, Dr. Mark Newman. I always like to be introduced by Carl because he makes you seem so much better than you are. So uh, it's a key thing. But uh, I want to thank everyone here today. This is really an exciting day for the University of Kentucky, but it's really a very important day for all the people of Kentucky. 
I would like to extend my gratitude along that everybody else has with, you know, Congressman Andy Barr and all of our Kentucky congressional delegation who have done so much to support us in seeking the federal research funding that we need to try to make a difference in the lives of our patients. I always also want to thank Governor Bevin and Senate President Stivers and everyone in the state legislature who have helped make the construction of this building a reality, not only for us, but for the entire Commonwealth. And to Vice President Lisa Cassis, who I've, I've known just over a year, as a leader of the, of the university research enterprise, she has done a remarkable job at increasing the breadth and depth of UK's research funding and has done so much to make this extraordinary day possible. Research is the key to clinical advances. If it weren't for innovative research, medicine and medical treatment would be stagnant. We may not know the incredible advances that we come to take for granted today. For Kentucky and for this region, it is vital that we not halt or hinder this progress. This magnificent building, and most importantly, the great people who will populate it and bring it to life with their hard work, ingenuity, and brilliance will help us move Kentucky forward in our efforts in combating diseases that are a burden to all of our citizens and at higher rates than we see anywhere else in the country. If we are going to make great strides in healthcare, in fighting diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, the opioid epidemic, it starts here. In 1900, the life expectancy of Americans was just 47 for men, 49 for women, and it was lower for, our, for people of color. Today in the United States, the life expectancy is about 76 for men, 81 for women, although we worry about where it's going. How did we increase the lifespan for 30 years, of 30 years? Research. We have learned to eat better, we've learned to live better, we've learned to how to care for our patients better, and how to treat diseases better all through research. And while we are still learning, we truly are still learning every day. Investment in research significantly improves our health and well-being. It's the medicines that we're able to use. It's the development of new procedures and technology. But before you can experience these advances in the clinics, it all starts here. The building, this building affords us the opportunity to attract more researchers and more funding, which will lead to an even greater impact. State-of-the-art space that UK has will not only attract some of our best research recruits, but it's not just the space. It's about the level of support that people can see from our state and, and our federal government and from the people around them, like those of you that are here today. We already see this building helping us. If we look at Markey Cancer Center has already recruited two major new scientists who are coming on board in the next few months and bringing with them millions of dollars in research funding. Soon researchers and their teams of scientists will begin to fill this building and conduct research that will impact the future of healthcare in Kentucky and of all of us here. Thank you to everyone who has made the opening of this research building possible and thus made the possibilities for research and for patient care unlimited. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Newman. And next up, this gentleman's had quite a couple of weeks. When he was a student at the University of Kentucky, he served as student government president well, I'll tell you what, he made the most of that in his life. Not only to go on to earn a medical degree, and he's a doctor in his own right, 
but he's been serving as chair of the University of Kentucky Board of Trustees in a very effective manner. Please welcome Dr. Britt Brockman, chair of the UK Board of Trustees. Thanks, Carl. Uh, Carl just uh, introduced Dr. Newman out of order, and he said, I hope it's okay if I uh, skipped over you. And I said, I sure as heck didn't want to follow Robert Stivers after that talk. Uh, Senator Stivers, Governor, uh, I, we can't thank you enough for what you've made possible. And Congressman Barr, thank you too, sir. Uh, I'm going to get off script. I use, rarely, as in never, have done this. But let me tell you how the research works. Seven years ago, and I'm an ophthalmologist, I had an idea. Many of us in this room have ideas, and someone carries through that idea, and we said, I thought of that. Yeah, you thought of it, but what did you do with the idea? Well, research at a university, uh, as it stood, it, it, for an outsider, for me, with an idea, was a challenge to find someone with whom to collaborate. I had an idea about uh, a pressure sensor that would go inside the eyeball to measure pressure for glaucoma. I'm an ophthalmologist. It wasn't easy to find uh, the right person to collaborate, but after a fair amount of searching, and thank goodness for my position, I found that person. And six years later, and over $2 million of NIH grants, I have in collaboration with researchers at this university, uh, research that's ongoing in animal studies and hopefully uh, within 12 months in human studies. A building like this makes that so much easier and so much more possible. So to just take this building for granted as a nice place for nice research to occur is to way undersell the value. So. On behalf of the Board of Trustees and University family today, we have the opportunity to begin writing the next chapter in this history of UK's research enterprise. I believe that we can make a difference. I believe that Kentucky can stem the tide. Kentucky can end the scourge of cancer that for too long has cut short far too many lives in the Commonwealth. Kentucky can eradicate the plague of addiction and overdoses that are decimating communities across the state. Kentucky can address the social, economic, cultural, and community constraints that mitigate the potential of path-breaking intervention. It's who we are. It's why we partner with elected officials and the people of Kentucky. They are looking to us to deliver on a bold promise forged more than 150 years ago. We can transform our state. Kentucky can. As President Capilouto often says, we are building and growing not for ourselves, but for our future, a healthier future. Here in this space, UK faculty, leading scholars and scientists will work day and night to make progress. But progress won't only be made in the halls of this new space. It will occur in the towns across Kentucky, alongside families, patients, and in communities. Because when we bring together the best minds science has to offer, when we construct the best facilities for an innovative approach to research, when we share an enduring commitment to be on the front lines with those we serve, then we can accomplish tremendous things. The people of our, our state are counting on us. With a sense of dogged determination and deep compassion, we will. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brockman. Last but certainly not least in our lineup of speakers this morning, Dr. Lisa Cassis. Now, Dr. Elisa Cassis, let me tell you first of all, from having had the privilege of interviewing her on a couple of different occasions, she's very pleasant, but she's also an extremely knowledgeable woman, a personable uh, person who speaks with passion to research. She is rather unique among vice presidents for research at institutions around the country, and that is the fact that she is still an active researcher. 
She's had a lab here at the University of Kentucky for 30 years and as the president alluded to, brought in millions of research funding. But that gives her a unique ability to know what's needed in a building like this. So let's all join in welcoming a person who was at the heart of this building, Dr. Lisa Cassis. Thank you, Carl. Good morning. You're right. In my 30 years here as a faculty member at UK, I've really never been so excited. <laughs> it's just so exciting to be here. So the opening of this facility really gives us hope that the future will hold less of these devastating diseases that you've heard about that impact the lives of people in Kentucky. In partnership with the state, and we thank you so much, we have done something bold through the building concept and design. We're breaking down walls and silos we're putting together researchers across many disciplines and approaches. And importantly, and I think you've heard this, we're bringing new talent to the institution to work in this bold new setting. All of this with the goal of preventing and tr treating the diseases that are just too common in Kentucky. Cancer, cardiovascular diseases and stroke, obesity and diabetes, and of special concern, the opioid and substance use disorders. We chose to focus research within the facility on these common diseases because we have con considerable existing strength in each of these areas, because we have a strong academic medical center that delivers advanced specialty care in these areas, and because we have the breadth of disciplines at UK that can approach the problem from many different perspectives. So today we're opening phase one of the facility and it's dedicated to solving those pressing health problems of our citizens. But we didn't get here today without the support and hard work of many people. So before I tell you about the amazing facility, please let me acknowledge my colleagues. First, I thank President Capilouto for his vision. He talked about it as my baby. I felt like it was the childbirth part of my baby a lot, but it is. Um, it's really, though, his leadership, his dedication, and his philanthropy that took us towards this goal. He's worked with our team from the beginning, giving input and advice on the building design and its use. His passion to help Kentuckians really empowers and inspires us and his background in public health is a clear asset. He recognizes the importance of bringing people together across disciplines to develop solutions to complex problems. Next, I would like to thank the leadership and facilities, Vice President Mary Vosevich and her team, most especially Bob Williams, the UK lead team on this project. If you haven't met Bob, and there he is in that blue shirt, please do so and shake his hand. He's efficient and effective. He tirelessly answers our many questions. He always provides us with great advice on how to best use the space and the resources at hand. And he does so while smiling and joking with our team. Bob has been the UK liaison to the excellent design team led by Champlin Architecture, which included HGA Architects, Jacobs Consultancy, Affiliated Engineers, CMTA, THP Limited, Towers Gold Landscape Architecture, and Carmen. The building construction was led by Whiting Turner and included more than 100 trade contractors and subcontractors, employing nearly 2,000 tradesmen and craftsmen, the vast majority of which were residents of Kentucky. Along the way, we engage the best and brightest minds at UK in the design and use of this facility. Many of these faculty and staff are here with us today, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank each and every one of them. Our UK teams, who have been working with us for almost four years, include faculty and staff from across the university, as well as deans and leaders and center directors. They came together with one purpose, to make the most of this precious resource, and they continue to work with us as we recruit new talent to the institution. So now let's briefly review the basics of this incredible facility. 
The building is a six floor facility of approximately 300,000 square feet. The laboratories are called neighborhoods and each neighborhood can hold up to six different principal investigators and the people within their program. Researchers within a neighborhood work together just like the neighborhoods where you live. The labs have open light for a great working atmosphere, and the benches within a neighborhood are surrounded by specialized procedure rooms that will be shared by multiple investigators. Each floor has multiple collaborative spaces that are intended to facilitate conversation, just like when you take a walk through the neighborhood and you chat with your neighbor. In phase one of the building, we're opening two floors, one focused on cancer research and one on diabetes and obesity. These floors will have a mixture of researchers from different departments and colleges, many of whom have been newly recruited to UK to add depth and dimension to our approach. When the sixth floor facility is completed over time, it can hold up to 100 principal investigators, employing over 500 research personnel, all of whom are dedicated to the prevention and treatment of cancer cardiovascular diseases and stroke, diabetes, obesity, and substance abuse. But it doesn't really stop at this. Perhaps one of the most innovative and power as powerful aspects of this facility is the three-store connector building. Our goal with a connector facility is to translate the research we're performing to have the biggest impact on the community, most especially the Appalachian community experiencing the heaviest burden of these diseases. The three-floor connector building, which now brings together researchers across a three-building complex, will house 24 additional investigators and their personnel, many of whom will be newly recruited to UK. They will approach these difficult health problems from different perspectives, including behavioral aspects, clinical research, computation and big data, public health, economics, and research that focuses on how health services are delivered. These investigators will share common spaces with those residing within the sixth floor facility, sparking conversation and collaboration. We can already feel the magic happening. These diseases have several common underlying aspects, and our faculty teams from a myriad of disciplines have been brainstorming on how to best use this resource. The facility will allow us to think outside the box, which is what it will take as we set our sights on reducing the burden of these diseases. Yes, indeed, this is a great day, and we're really excited about the future, not just because of the bricks and mortar, but because the building gives us a powerful new approach to research. So on behalf of UK researchers, I thank each and every one of you who have, who have contributed to this day. Let's get to work now. Thanks.